Hello everyone, my name is Mark, and welcome to this new episode of the Mito Podcast. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Mito Podcast is a new program that we hope will build awareness in the mitochondrial medicine, research, and patient advocacy community on topics related to mitochondrial disease and health, as well as to highlight cutting-edge research in the field. Our audio format episodes are approximately 10 minutes in length and will feature the exciting work of an expert in the field in a way that can be understood by all in the community, regardless of educational background. Included with every episode will be an infographic summary of what was discussed, so please check that out as well. Today, I am excited to be joined by Dr. Carolyn Cummins. Dr. Cummins is an Associate Professor with the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto. Following the completion of her undergraduate studies in chemistry at McGill University, Dr. Cummins completed a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry at the University of California, San Francisco. After taking a Howard Hughes Medical Institute postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, she helped identify the first ligand for a nuclear receptor in C. elegans, a nematode worm. She also identified a role for the liver X receptor in controlling levels of stress hormone production. Dr. Cummins, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Mito Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a brand new experience, so I'm very excited. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on. So your research program investigates the mechanisms by which nuclear hormone receptors are involved in metabolic disorders such as diabetes. Could you explain more about your research in this area? And what role does mitochondrial dysfunction play in these disease pathways? Absolutely. It's always a pleasure to discuss the new areas that we're exploring. And as you mentioned, my group is focused on the study of a class of receptors that act as transcription factors in cells and that have been shown to be essential for many aspects of metabolism. Some of the receptors I study are involved in stress hormone signaling and in fatty acid signaling. What kind of appeals to me about the nuclear receptors as a class is that they possess a subdomain in their structure that binds to small molecules and therefore can be targeted with new drugs. I, I think Mito podcast listeners will be probably more interested in the work that we do involving two nuclear receptors that respond to endogenous fatty acids known as PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma. Um, these receptors are essential for the proper storage and utilization of fatty acids in the body. And as you know, mitochondria are the gatekeepers of proper utilization of fatty acids to allow breakdown and eventual conversion into the energy that we use. And so what we've found is that activation of both PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma using a drug that looks similar to the fatty acids that it recognizes in the body, promotes weight loss and insulin sensitization in obese mice. And so part of the mechanism involved is the preferential use of fatty acids by mitochondria for energy. The weight loss that we see appears to be related to a process by which um, is a revving up of the use of fatty acids in, a, in essence, burning of fat um, through a mitochondrial uncoupling process. And so this compound that we're testing um, was created by a collaborator, Dr. Luis Romero, who's at the University of Brasilia in Brazil. What are some next steps you would like to take in your research? And how do you see this translating in diagnosis and treatment? Well, most recently, we've been quite fortunate to have acquired the use of a new high-throughput instrument called the Seahorse uh, that can measure oxygen consumption and proton production in cells. And having access to this instrument allowed us to get an idea as to how our drug was increasing fat burning in our mice. And as it turns out, it appeared that what it was doing was it was increasing uncoupling uh, of protons from the production of energy. And that gets released in cells as heat. And so the concept of enhancing an organism's ability to burn fat is somewhat new in its overall concept. And so we're still not sure whether this strategy will be translatable to humans. 
So far, our data have been carried out in obese mice or in cell lines derived from mice. However, because it's showing promise, we have continued to develop this compound. And so far, we've performed pharmacokinetic studies uh, to determine its half-life and analyzed its bioavailability in mice. And um, certainly, additional studies need to be performed in another animal model of type 2 diabetes or dyslipidemia. Um, and in addition, we need to do long-term dosing studies um, to assess if there's any unexpected toxicities that will, you know, kind of pop up after a long treatment period. But one thing I, I've always been quite excited about with this compound is that it's derived from an abundant natural byproduct of the cashew nut shell industry of Brazil, yeah. which is a very large industry. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, if it ever did become a therapeutic, it would be very economical to produce. Yes. So thank you for that, Dr. Cummins. Are there any novel therapies that you believe shows significant promise with respect to alleviating metabolic disorders? Well, specifically in terms of type 2 diabetes, yeah. there actually have been a couple of very prominent recent success stories. Mm -hmm. And um, these new classes of compounds are very effective at decreasing blood glucose and have actually shown this added side benefit of improving signs of chronic kidney disease as well as um, cardiovascular disease. And so those agents either work by increasing excretion of glucose into the urine. So those agents are called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and another class um, is their mechanism is to enhance the action of um, insulin by this new secreted gog called GLP-1. And exactly how these benefits extend to um, decreasing cardiovascular and kidney disease are quite debated, but nonetheless, the fact that they do both that and decrease glucose is actually a really significant advance for the field. The development of new treatments for disorders involving mitochondrial dysfunction is not easy. In your view, how can we accelerate therapeutic development in a careful and responsible way that prioritizes patient safety? Is it even possible to achieve this balance of ensuring patient safety while developing drugs quickly? Yes, I think it's a bit of a it's a bit of an oxymoron to say mm -hmm. drug development quickly. <laughs> However, um, like as you know, I mean, drug development takes a lot of time and a significant investment. Um, that said, I don't think that the traditional methods of drug development that we're using these days are the only methods. And I'm actually a big proponent of open science in terms of. Um, making sure that um, data get published as soon as possible so that this greater scientific community can benefit and that um, our understanding of disease and targeting of certain aspects can actually advance much more quickly. So it's, it's my hope that um, we can have a parallel system to develop drugs alongside, let's say, big pharma that actually takes advantage of this concept of open drug discovery to further advance uh, therapeutics to get to clinic uh, more quickly and more affordably. Great, thank you. From the perspective of a research scientist, how do you think a network of patients, researchers, and physicians collaborating together benefits mitochondrial medicine and research? And how can patients benefit from those of diverse backgrounds coming together to solve pressing issues in mitochondrial medicine and research? So it's a great question because I attended MitoNet in the fall, and it was the first time I had attended. The Mito 2019 conference, right? That's yes, correct. Yes, Sorry, yes. yes. <laughs> no Last fall. And I was taken by the uniqueness of the conference because of the diversity of the attendees. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was my first conference that featured patient voices that, uh, that was very moving. Um, so it was an excellent reminder uh, of the importance of the day-to-day -day work that we do in the laboratory and how it will one day impact on uh, patient experiences. And, and that's, I think, something particularly unique to a basic science perspective because I think medical doctors are interacting with patients 
on a daily basis and are reminded of the importance of what they do. But for basic scientists that are often in a mm -hmm. lab, um, it's it was a very uh, unique experience that I I welcomed. And I think for patients, maybe having the opportunity to interact with uh, scientists is is also unique. And um, bringing people together that have diverse perspectives is always a good thing. It's always going to open up new avenues and new ways of looking at things and thinking about problems. Thank you, Dr. Cummins. Uh, so before we wrap up this installment of the Mito podcast, do you have a message for the listeners, like a final message for the listeners, pardon me, and where can they contact you if they would like to learn more about your work? Uh, thank you for that. My laboratory uh, has a website. It's www.cumminslab.com. I'm also on Twitter and uh, fairly active there at Cummins Lab or at Carolyn L. Cummins. And um, I think my message maybe to listeners is uh, thank you for your interest. I think that mitochondrial disease is impacts so many aspects of chronic disease as well as rare diseases. And uh, as a per basic scientist in this area, I think um, keeping an open mind as to where discoveries are going to come from is really critical. And to not be too focused on always having a therapeutic uh, outcome in mind at the very beginning of a research study. You know, science for the sake of understanding how cells work is fundamental to the eventual discovery of therapeutics. Thank you so much, Dr. Cummins, for coming on the program today. Before we end this episode, I would like to thank all our listeners. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Please head on over to our website to download our episodes and to see the upcoming events we have for this year. We have some exciting initiatives planned, so please stay tuned. Thank you all once again, and tune in to our next episode featuring another expert doing exciting work in the field of mitochondrial medicine.